please bear with me in this episode. I have the flu. My voice isn't what it usually is, so please enjoy. Dennis Rader lived in a modest home at 6220 Independent Street in a quiet neighborhood in Park City, Kansas. It's a neighborhood much like any other with the exception that a serial killer lived there, raising a family and enjoying what many would consider a normal life. Rader was known to be a friendly, outgoing person who sometimes took walks and would wave and say hello to his neighbors as he passed by. And it was on one of these evening strolls when he spotted Marine Hedge, who lived only six doors down from where he and his family called home. Over the years, Rader would enjoy his evening strolls, and he often saw 53-year-old Marine Wallace Hedge working in her yard, but she was never too busy to throw him a friendly hello as he and his daughter walked by. Although Dennis Rader and Marine Hedge lived on the same block, he never knew her name until seeing it on the news after he killed her. He often referred to her as Marie any time his wife mentioned her working in her yard. Marine worked as the second shift supervisor at a coffee shop at Wesley Medical Center, where Rader had seen her a few times, which is why he dubbed her Project Cookie. On the afternoon of April 26, 1985, Dennis Rader took his son and Cub Scout pack on an overnight camping trip. It was on this trip that Rader slipped away, drove into town, and took the life of his neighbor of over 30 years. After her death, it took almost a year and a half before BTK would strike again. At the time, Dennis Rader worked for the security company ADT, and when he wasn't on a job site, he liked to use his time and company vehicle to cruise the neighborhoods in what he called his trolling phase, looking for potential victims. It was one of these afternoon excursions on a warm day in June of 1986 when Raider spotted Vicki Weggerly exiting her gold 1978 Monte Carlo and walking into her house. He took to her instantly and decided to pay her another visit many weeks later. On a hot evening near the middle of July, Raider parked a few blocks away and took a summer stroll past her house, but as he passed by he could hear music coming from the open windows. Once he came even to the house, he saw her through the front window sitting at her piano, playing what he considered some of the most beautiful music he had ever heard. It was at this moment that all other potential projects were put on hold, and BTK made Project Piano, as he referred to Vicki Weggerly, his main priority. Two months later, on September 16, 1986, around 11 a.m., Raider, dressed as a telephone repairman, visited a couple of Vicki Weggerly's neighbors telling them he would be working on the phone lines in the area. He then went to Vicky's house where she played piano while her two-year-old son played in the playpen after dropping her nine-year-old daughter off at school. Raider knocked and after checking on her son, she walked up to the open screen door. He told her he was working on phone lines in the neighborhood and thinking him a legitimate repairman, she let him in. After showing him to the phone near the dining room, Raider pretended to test the line before pulling out his three fifty seven Magnum pistol. Vicky told Raider her husband was on his way home for lunch, but not to be deterred, he quickly strangled her in the bedroom before escaping in her car, leaving her two-year-old son alone in the living room. Only one block away, while driving home for lunch with his wife and son, Vicky Wiggerly's husband Bill noticed an unknown man pass him in his wife's car. He would spend the rest of his life knowing that if he had been five minutes earlier, his wife and the mother of his kids might still be alive, and he could have avoided becoming Wichita PD's main suspect in her murder. When it came to the victims of BTK, no one was safe. Whether you were a longtime neighbor with years worth of waves and hellos, or a young wife and mother spending time with her child, all women and children were potential projects for the madman who terrorized the city of Wichita, Kansas for over 30 years. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of the American Serial Killer Guidebook. Help the show by giving us a like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode of our in-depth series on the crimes and capture of BTK, one of America's most notorious serial killers. Now let me ask you a question. How many times have you said hello to a neighbor or let a repairman into your home and thought nothing of it? Chances are, at least one of these people got out of bed that morning with you specifically in mind. Stay tuned to the rest of this episode to find out how far Dennis Rader would go to get close to his victims, the clever tricks he used to lull them into a false sense of security, and the merciless horrors he would subject them to before going back to his normal life as husband, father, and leader of his church. 
You're listening to the American Serial Killer Guidebook. Around 7 p.m. on the cool, rainy Friday evening of April 26, 1985, 53-year-old Maureen Wallace Hedge left her home with a male friend for an evening of bingo and some dinner. By that time, Dennis Rader was with his Cub Scout pack and had already set up their camp and was helping his troop with their knot tying and fire starting skills. A few hours later, under the guise of a severe headache, Rader left his pack with a chaperoning parent to go home for the night to take aspirin and get some sleep before returning the following morning to help pack up. On his way back, Rader pulled onto North 159th Street East outside of Andover, Kansas, a few miles east of Wichita, to change into what he called his hit clothes because he was still wearing a scout uniform which he put into a bowling ball bag he brought with him as part of his plan. Once changed, he drove to a bowling alley across the street from the Brittany Center located at 21st Street and Woodlawn in Wichita, Kansas, and went inside to be seen as an, any other patron there to have a good time. He ordered a beer and walked around a bit before going into the restroom and splashing some beer on his face and shirt to smell like he'd been drinking all evening, then called himself a taxi. Once the cab arrived, Raider stumbled into the back telling the driver, the guys and I have been out partying. I need somebody to drive me home. Raider had the driver drop him off on Parkview Street, one block east of Independent Street, which is where Marine Hedge and Dennis Raider both lived. He cut between the houses, crossing the small wooded area between the rear of the houses, then snuck around Marine's house and spotted her 1976 Monte Carlo parked in the driveway. He went back around to the rear, cut the phone line, and thinking she was inside, entered through the back door as quietly as he could. He spent the next ten minutes quietly going from room to room before realizing no one was home, which he thought was strange because it was after 10 p.m. and she was usually home by then. Before he could rummage through the house, Raider heard a car door slam out front, so he ran to Marine's bedroom and hid in her closet. He heard voices in the living room noting one was male, so he decided to wait for Marine's boyfriend to leave rather than risking a confrontation that might not go his way. A couple of hours later, Raider heard the boyfriend leave and decided to wait until he was sure she was in bed before emerging from the closet around 1 a.m. Since she didn't wake up like he expected when he flipped on the bathroom light, he stood there for a few minutes watching her sleep, excitedly anticipating what was to come. When he couldn't take it anymore, he jumped on top of Mrs. Hedge, causing her to wake up, yelling, What in the hell is going on? He began strangling her with his bare hands, or throttling her as he put it when describing what happened to police years later. Marine continued to fight back as best she could, but as her friends and neighbors described her, she was a friendly, 53-year-old, 100-pound woman with a smooth southern accent, so it was easy for Raider to gain control, continuing to choke her until she was unconscious. Once he was sure she was out, he took her nightgown and underwear off before putting on handcuffs and strangling her to death. By this time, he was tired and his hands were cramping, so he took a few minutes to catch his breath and regain his composure. He rummaged through her purse, taking her driver's license and keys, then looked through the rest of her house, collecting various items like undergarments, jewelry, and coins. He then wrapped Maureen's nude body in blankets and a bedspread, and dragged her outside, putting her in the trunk of her own car, and drove her to the Christ Lutheran Church where he had keys because he was the congregation president. By then it was after 3 a.m. and any lights in the church would have drawn attention, so using rolls of black plastic, previously hidden in the church in anticipation of this night, he blacked out the windows, then quickly ran outside to ensure no light could be seen by anyone who might be passing by. He spent the next couple of hours taking pictures of her in different poses with different types of bondage from handcuffs, tape, and cords to rope and nylons before loading her back into her trunk. It was nearing dawn and Raider had to clean the church and get back to the scout camp by 7.30 or 8 a.m., so he drove her nude body, rewrapped in blankets, about seven miles east and dumped her near a concrete culvert on East 53rd Street North between Webb and Greenwich Roads. He covered her with brush and trash and turned to leave, but when he first parked to get out of the car, he set the keys on the dash and they slipped down between the vent and the windshield. And if any of you remember the older vehicles, when something slipped down between the vent and the windshield, it was pretty much there from now on. 
No matter what he tried, he couldn't reach the keys, so, pressed for time and not wanting to be found on the side of the road early in the morning with a dead body, he broke the windshield to get him, then fired up the engine and headed back to the church. On the way back, Raider noticed the comfort and power of the Monte Carlo and later told police he had wished it was his. Once at the church, he quickly cleaned up anything he may have left behind, including the plastic, took a shower, and headed to the parking lot at Brittany Center. He parked Marine's car, then casually walked across the street to the bowling alley parking lot, got in his car, and left Wichita, making it back to his Cub Scout campsite just after 8 a.m. Saturday morning. Raider spent the weekend savoring his latest kill, but remembered that he forgot to remove the cords he used to bind her. The following Monday, early in the morning before work, and while it was still dark outside, he returned to the dump site but couldn't find her body. After a few frantic minutes, he located her and removed the cords, changing his boots once he got back in the ADT van, then waited to see what the news would say about his handiwork. Her empty purse was found in a ditch on April 28th, her car was found on May 2nd with a bedspread and blanket in the trunk, and her body was found on May 5th, 1985. He enjoyed watching the news and the police getting nowhere, which satisfied him for the moment. It would be almost a year and a half before his need to kill would surface again, with the victim being a young 28-year-old wife and mother named Vicki Weggerly. On the morning of September 16, 1986, Vicki Weggerly, with her two-year-old son Brandon in the back seat, drove her nine-year-old daughter Stephanie to her elementary school to begin another day in fourth grade. Vicki and her husband Bill were high school sweethearts who met when they were 16 and married by 17 welcoming their daughter the following year. Nine years later, Bill had a good job. They had a second child and a comfortable home. Life was good until their peaceful, happy lives were destroyed by a monster that fateful day while Bill was on his way home for lunch with his wife and son. A little after 10 a.m. that morning, Dennis Rader pulled into the parking lot of the Indian Hills Shopping Center across the street from Vicki Weggerly's house at 2404 West 13th Street North in Wichita, Kansas. He quickly donned a yellow hard hat he took from his shop at ADT, where he worked, with a Southwestern Bell logo attached to the front that he had cut off the front of a phone book he had stolen earlier. Dressed in the hard hat, slacks, a button-down shirt and tie, and carrying a briefcase, he hoped he looked close enough to a real Southwestern Bell telephone repairman to fool anyone who might be watching. Once he gained his composure, Raider crossed the street, but rather than go directly to the Weggerly home, he went to the neighbor on the east side. An older couple answered the door, and Raider told them he was working on telephone lines in the area and wanted to come in and check the cables for static. After he fake-tested their lines, he headed next door where he could hear the sound of a piano coming from the open windows and the front screen door. He walked up to the door and knocked. Hearing the music stop and a few moments later, Vicki Weggerly, wearing her trademark smile, answered the door. Wearing his most disarming smile, Raider introduced himself as a repairman with Southwestern Bell Telephone Company. He said they've been doing work in the neighborhood and he'd like to test her line connectors with a piece of equipment that required him to come in. And being the trusting, courteous woman she was, she invited him in and showed him to the phone near the dining room table. Raider made small talk with Vicky while he pretended to test the line with a signal toner he'd taken from work. After he was putting the toner back into his briefcase, he said, Well, looks like it works, before pulling his three fifty seven Magnum from the briefcase, turning around and telling her, Let's go to the bedroom. Vicky looked over into the living room at her two-year-old son, Brandon, playing in the playpen and said, Well, how about my kid? Raider replied, I don't know about your kid. Vicky started shaking and crying, extremely upset, and told him, My husband is going to be home pretty soon, to which Dennis Rader smugly replied, Let's hope he's not going to be home too soon. Once in the bedroom, he tied her up with some items he found laying around, but knowing who he was and that she was going to be killed, she fought for her life. She broke the bonds and began slapping, hitting, and scratching him, anything to get him off her, and Rader later made a point to express to the police that she fought so hard he barely managed to regain control. She left a deep scratch on his face before he finally ended the joyous life of Vicki Weggerly, and in doing so, destroyed the lives of her entire family by using a nylon stocking and leather shoelace to strangle the life from her. Raider rolled her onto her back and unzipped her pants, then pulling her panties down a few inches. 
He then pulled up her blue top and bra, exposing her breasts, before taking three photos of her body with a Polaroid camera. The dogs were barking like crazy, and the fight had been loud, with the windows open the entire time. Knowing her husband was on his way home, and worried that someone may have heard the noise, he gathered up his briefcase, her driver's license, and her keys before jumping in her gold Monte Carlo. He actually passed Vicky's husband, Bill, who was on his way home for lunch, before ditching her car two blocks away at the Indian Hills Meat Market, on the corner of West 13th Street North and Edwards Court. Dennis Rader walked the two blocks back to his truck, dressed in his repairman disguise, with the Weggerly home within sight the entire time since he parked his truck directly across the street. As he was pulling out of the parking lot, he saw a car parked in the driveway, which he assumed was her husband's, and an EMS vehicle coming in fast. On his way back to his office, he thought about how close he'd come to having to deal with another man, and the possibility of getting caught. Five minutes longer and everything could have turned out very differently. For the next 20 years, Vicki Wiggerly's husband, Bill, lived under the cloud of suspicion for her murder. Friends and family turned their backs on them. The kids grew up being bullied by classmates whose parents told them the Wiggerly children were bad and their father was a killer. It was nearly impossible for Bill to find steady work because the specter of her murder hung over him and his reputation. It wasn't until Raider's capture in 2005 that Bill was vindicated, but by that time he and his daughters had lived 20 years without Vicky and had moved on with their lives until forced to relive every painful moment at Dennis Raider's trial. Maybe it was another close call, or maybe he'd been satisfied for the time being, but BTK didn't rear his ugly head again for five years after murdering Vicky Weggerly. 1991 saw the killing of his tenth and final victim. 62-year-old Dolores Davis. By this point, BTK had lost all sense of subtlety and simply threw a cinder block through her rear glass sliding door before barging in and murdering her. Make sure to listen to our next episode where we cover all of the ways BTK's last kill went wrong and how after going quiet for the next 14 years, Dennis Rader faced the beginning of the end of his reign of terror over the people of Wichita, Kansas. I'm Elton Morgan. Show us some love with a like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And join our Patreon where you can listen to our unedited episodes with every screw-up and cuss word included. Stay tuned for the next chapter of The American Serial Killer Guidebook.